Well, if you find yourself overwhelmed with too much to do, trying to keep all the plates spinning, you're going to love today's interview. I'm incredibly honored to talk to one of my good friends, Juliet Funt. Juliet is one of the most interesting thought leaders in the world of business and honestly, a world-class speaker. She's been called a warrior against the reactive busyness and an expert in strategies to reduce unnecessary work and streamline processes. Her organization, you're going to want to dig into it, is called White Space at Work, and she provides amazing consulting and training for organizations and individuals who want to improve workplace efficiency and create healthy rhythms for their workers. And a fun fact for those of you that are old enough to remember the television show Candid Camera, well, she's the daughter of Alan Funt, who hosted the show. Juliet, it's amazing to have a chance to interview you today. Welcome to the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. Thank you so much. It's fun to be here. Well, Amy and I loved our time with you. We got to know each other, I guess it's been a couple of years ago at the Global Leadership Summit. And your talk uh, was one of the high points of the summit. And so thank you for your contribution. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry I wasn't there this year with you. Was it a blast? We missed you this year. It really was. We had a we had a great time and uh, we've got it. We've got to get you back again. Yes. Well, 21, if not before. That's when I'm slated. Well, last year, what people may not know is that I think they invited you. How? What, what, what was it like? Two days before as a fill-in? Thirty-six hours. Thirty-six <laughs> hours, and you wrote a, a new talk <laughs> and uh, and crushed it. Ah, thanks. Let, let's do this. Let's start out, and I'd like to hear a little bit about your personal journey and how you conceived of the white space concept. Can you tell us how you came up with this idea? Yeah, it had an interesting mixture of origins. There was a little business and a little personal and a little spiritual. So I'll kind of give you all three recipes ingredients and, and tell you how they kind of blended together. So the business context was that I was coaching a lot of executives who were busy and overloaded during this time, which was about 12, 13 years ago when really the white space term was coined. And we would constantly talk about literally the white spaces on their day runner or their planner at the time, because it was the white, the presence of that white that actually became a precursor to the most efficient, effective, and creative days in their week. And so that was kind of recipe ingredient number one was literally looking looking for white on people's calendars. Another ingredient was uh, kind of a spiritual part of my life when I was getting a little bit more involved in my Judaic roots, which had been very, very secular when I was a child. And I was keeping a fairly observant Shabbat where I started reading authors who were talking about Saturday and the Sabbath as being this castle in time. And it was this period of the week where there was this unscheduled, open, beautiful, fluid time that had no assignment. And that experience, that visceral experience of having the Sabbath or the Shabbos be off duty became a, the first visceral component of white space. And then everything kind of came together when I became a mom and I had these three boys, uh, none of whom ever slept ever. <laughs> and so I would lay with my children every single night while they would fall asleep. And I had this forced, what I would later come to understand was white space time when I'd be trapped in a dark bedroom, doing nothing but holding somebody's hand and waiting for them to fall asleep. And suddenly I noticed that unlike any other experience that I'd had, that my brain was lit with creative ideas and business solutions and introspection and strategy. And I would dash out of that room every night looking for a pencil because the forced experience of having open time had unlocked something in me that I hadn't experienced before. And so these different elements started coming together to build the idea that there needed to be a missing ingredient reinserted back into work, into life, which was this white space time, which we define as a strategic pause taken between activities. So it is any moment of time that has no assignment that can then be utilized for strategy or creativity or recovery recuperation or introspection or all of the thoughtful activities that we don't have time to do because we're busy deleting away in our inbox or rushing from task to task. So I love that phrase, a strategic pause between activities. And I am like very personally excited about this interview because I just recently, Julia, hired and started working with a performance psychologist to kind of in increase my productivity because my responsibilities have been kind of increasing at a rapid pace, even faster than, faster than my ability to grow into it. Mm. So interestingly enough, one of the very first place he started was recognizing I didn't have much recovery time. 
And so instead of trying to cram more in, he's actually trying to create more space where there's where I'm not doing things that, that will help me to be more productive. So it sounds a little go. bit like that's what you're, it's you're talking about. It's one version of it. Absolutely. And, and a, any physical analogy probably plays well with you, but any Olympian knows the critical element of recovery is part of training or muscular building or improving skills in any sport. And so they build in recovery time, but we don't tend to do that in work or with our minds or in our own stamina outside of the realm of prepping for the Olympics, but it's exactly the same. And and I agree completely with your coach. Yes, and the, the reflection time matters. And, and I, I wanna look at the why this is a problem first and then kind of get into the how, but I think probably everyone listening knows what it feels like to be overloaded with too much going on in our organizations. I want to start, Julia, with talking about why this is such a big problem. Why do you think so many people feel helpless about overcoming the busyness? There's so many different reasons. I just, my brain froze up with seven things I wanted to say at the same time. But the, so first of all, people tend to have a personalization of the problem of busyness. So deep down inside, we all kind of feel like if we could just do something differently on an individual basis that we wouldn't feel this crushing sense of constant busyness and overload. So we tend to have self-blame sort of hurl us into this mentality where we think, if we could just find the right podcast, if we could just find the right filing system, there must be something about our will or our discipline or something about us that is really uniquely dragging us down. But when we studied the phenomenon of professional overload, we actually found that there were 27 different things that made people overloaded and very few of them had a sense of individual responsibility. They were things like the seasonality of an industry or the economy or the quarterly stockholders, shareholders call in in public companies, things that had completely nothing to do with an individual failing in the Olympics of productivity. But that's how people perceive it. Um, Most corporations get overloaded for a number of different reasons. Corporations or organizations, complexity is very, very seductive. And so we get more and more and more complex. And the more complex we get, the more systems and processes and meetings and metrics become a dependent part of our life. And so complexity is kind of drawing us along. But there are many reasons social conformity plays a big part, which we could unpack if you like. The intrusions of technology, we could probably spend the entire time talking about. So it's a stew of forces that are weighted against us, against us as individuals who simply want to find a way of working that feels sane and humane and meaningful. So I do want to dive into some of those things that you brought up and get real, really practical and, and specific. First, I really want to highlight why this is a problem. You, um, you've done a lot of research and found some kind of alarming statistics this one is haunting to me. So my organization, Julia, we have about 750 staff <laughs> I know where you're so. going. This is what you said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, 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 companies and organizations lose $1 million in wasted productivity for every 50 workers every single year. That That's going to keep me awake tonight. Where'd you come up with this number and what does this mean for our organizations? Yeah, so that number comes out of the surveys that we do with clients before we work with them and out of our unique quantification process. So to our knowledge, we're the only company in the world that actually quantifies unnecessary work and tells companies how much it's worth, both in dollars and in opportunity costs. So we get that from incredibly simple math, math that your kids could do and even my kids who are younger can do. Um, I'll tell you kind of how the process breaks down. So if we were doing that for your 700, we'd ask them some questions and we'd say things like, of the meetings that you attend, how many hours do they take per day? And what percentage of them would you think of as unnecessary? And we define unnecessary as meetings where they're neither benefiting from nor contributing to being in the room. We ask them questions like how much CC email, how many interruptions per day, which then implicate a recovery time per interruption to return to task, and a couple of other categories, which include sometimes overload-related turnover intention, as in if you were going to leave your current job, will you use keywords like overload or stress or balance or workload? And then we take all that self-reporting 
time, how much time they're wasting, how much interruption recovery time, how much time on CCs and FYI and other garbage. And then we simply attach salary data to that information to figure out how much time and how much money the value is of that waste. And the number that we come back to, as you said, is about a million dollars annually for every 50 people in an organization. It's a shocking number, but what's so shocking is that the complacency and stagnancy in most organizations is so powerful that even after they know the number, they find a way to trick themselves back into thinking that this is a manageable way to work. And it is that resistance that is the most fascinating thing to me about all of this work. I hope that those who are listening will will kind of let that sink in and feel it, that according to your research, organizations will lose about a million dollars in wasted productivity for every 50 workers every single year. And in my world, we wouldn't just measure it in money too, but it'd be a, a loss of impact. Right. An and opportunity you, cost. You know, wasting valuable resources. Yes, opportunity cost. So I, I, I really hope that motivates people. We've this is this is a massive issue that we've got to solve. And I feel it in our organization all the time. We work really, really hard to guard against complicating uh, systems over solving problems with too many rules and bureaucracy. I, I want to kind of get into your mind about some of the reasons behind our organizational inefficiencies. In fact, I, I like one of the concepts you talk about, Julie. You call it hallucinated urgency. <laughs> yeah. Can you can you tell us what is hallucinated urgency and how does this creep into our organization? Oh, this is it's one of my favorites. It's just the constant and pernicious mirage that every single thing is urgent. So when we get an email and it's bold. There's all of a sudden this ticking clock of how fast are we going to respond? And when we get a text or a beep or a whir or a bark that comes from our pockets, there's this Pavlovian need to answer it right away. And if our boss asks us for something without even knowing the time frame, we just assume that the cadence that they want is, you know, respond immediately. And it's it's absolutely a maddening way to live and work. It keeps us constantly just pumping with dopamine and adrenaline, both of which addle our ability to be clear and focused. And, and we really see it as a constant problem. Of course, the as I say, the devil in our pockets is a big part of that, the technology, the ability to be connected all the time. So now our hallucinated urgency is not just urgent from eight to six or nine to five. We can have a sense of hallucinated urgency at 9.30 on a Thursday night when we have a moment of weakness and check email before bed or on Sunday where we're trying to have a day of peace. So it follows us everywhere. And most people have no way of parsing what really is urgent and what's not urgent. They don't get good cues from management. So they just have to default to do everything as fast as humanly possible or get in trouble. So if um, someone's listening and they are management and they send a request to somebody most likely the the team member is going to feel like this has got to be done now. What would you say to that manager or the leader to communicate, to, to help the person put it in the place of priority and not let it break their rhythm or productivity with a sense of an urgent response? Sure. So one of the techniques that, I can't remember if we did this at GLS the first year, I think we might have, that we use is called the NYR codes. This is an email tactic, but is very fun to share. They are codes that go in the outbound subject line of an email. And so this is a way within the medium of email where I think the worst of hallucinated urgency probably occurs for there to be some delineation between different levels. So if NYR Q is in the subject line of an email, that means I need your response quick. That is an email where there actually is a sense of urgency. NYRT, need your response today, has a different level of urgency. It means that there is some time sensitivity, but it can be any time in the course of the day. So that means you get an email that says NYRT at 9.15 in the morning, take your sweet time, answer at any time between now and the end of the day. NYRNBD, need your response next business day, is a tactic that I probably use the most because I'm in crazy time zones. I work at weird hours because I love setting my own schedule. And so NBD means I want your response at the beginning of the next business day. I'm the type of executive, like a lot of people who does not like to save things as drafts because I forget about them. I feel like I'm in Indonesia right now. If I want to send something 
link to my team. They're going to get it at insane hours of the day and the night. But if it says NBD that they know if they happen to see it on an evening and weekend, that I want them to stay off duty when they are off duty. And so that's a cue that I'm sending my team. It's really important too to reinforce that when they have to get in a little bit of trouble when they break it because their habitual desire to respond to you quickly is going to override the new habit of the codes. But when you get an email from them on a Saturday or in an evening, you have to kind of reinforce it and say, no, I actually, that said NBD and there's a reason it's in there. I don't want you responding because I want you to use that recuperative time on the evening and weekends to bring me a better employee at nine o'clock the next day. That's a good email tactic. And I have another one for if you want for not email. Okay. I want to review that one real quick because I want to make sure people get this. It's super valuable. So NYR means need your response, like get on it quickly. NYRT, need your response tomorrow. NYRQ is need your response quick. NYR on its own is just I need your response, but most people don't use it because it has no time frame. NYRQ is quick, Q for quick. NYRT, Mm -hmm today, a little bit slower than quick. You have a whole business day. And NYR NBD next business day is a good example of a delay technique that lets people have their off time. I don't need your response until the next business day. So if it's Friday at 7.30 and you get NBD, there is no expectation at all that you should touch that email until Monday morning. What's interesting is you even said if they did respond on a Saturday, you might gently correct them and say, no, I want you to have your white space time. I want you to have some recovery time. And so do not respond. This That means don't respond until Monday morning. Yeah. You have to inverse the thing they think they're getting in trouble for. So if you, they always think they're getting in trouble for not responding. We're not rewarding urgency. <laughs> right. And that's right. very, very counterintuitive, I think, to the way most of us work in this culture. So I like that idea. And, and you you had teased us with the idea of something that's not email. Yeah. So if you're, uh, there's a lot of different ways that bosses communicate priorities. And when you're in a verbal setting or in what we call a 3D setting in the world of white space, any meeting face-to-face, the technique is called spotlighting. So if you imagine you were looking at a big cornfield and there was a giant 50s kind of a floodlight that came on with a big chunk and there was one beam of light that lit up a piece of the corn, you'd know exactly where to look. And that's what we want teams doing. Spotlighting means if I rattle off 35 things that I'd like my assistant Jamie to do in the course of the week... I'm always going to end that download with a moment of spotlighting by saying, these are the three things in a really, really clear and overt way that I need you calling either most time sensitive or highest priority in terms of quality. And I'll do that in a meeting. I'll do that by the phone. Sometimes I'll do it in a Word document where I'll just use a physical highlight to say, make sure that these are your priorities. Because again, that sense of hallucinated urgency means that people instinctively feel like Everything should receive equal attention and prioritization, but that's not how we think as leaders. When we say, pick up my dry cleaning and prepare a proposal for a giant client, we might rattle those things off in a list, but we certainly don't have the the same weighting in our own minds. We just fail to communicate it down. So that image of the giant ka-chunk movie spotlight uh, will help you see what your teams need. They need unbelievably clear direction on where you want their eyes. Super helpful. Super helpful. Another thing you talk about, Juliet, in organizational inefficiencies, you, you talk about something you call tolerated misery. <laughs> why do we tolerate these problems and, and why are we complacent in our misery? Uh, uh, that that actually that term came out of a, a conversation at GLS with Tom DeVries where we were talking about just the human side. You know, we're we're business consultants and trainers, and we help companies change their mindset. So our job is to think about a business context for things, quantification, productivity, efficiency. But on the days that you visit teams and on the days that you get calls and emails from clients, it's the human stories that affect you and that you remember. It's the woman who was so stressed that her Graves' disease medication had to be tripled until we started working with them and then her stress reduced and she could actually go off some of her medication. It's people who never feel empowered to have a balanced life where they can go see a soccer game or get off a little bit early to do something that's of joy or pleasure. You know, it's it's people that you watch marching toward their own stress-related disability date and 
there is a huge amount of this, what we call tolerated misery in most corporations. And it was funny that around 2007, 2008, there was this period where everybody was terrified of losing their jobs. And so nobody would ever leave anywhere. And that was completely understandable because of the economy. But even as the shackles have been released, kind of reminds me of when you tie a baby, they say you tie a baby elephant to a stick and then you just keep it there and you keep tying it every day. And then it's 5,000 pounds and it, it never leaves the stick. It's it's so interesting and poignant to me as a person who's been an entrepreneur since college to watch people tolerate uh, such a difficult, difficult environment so much of the time. But but that, I have to say, is what we observe. Not in every company, but a lot. I think you're right. It just You kind of become used to the chains or the limitations. And so help us break out of that. You, you work with a lot of different companies, Juliet, and there's, there's probably some kind of common... Um, steps or you know ways that you alleviate the problems. What are some things that you suggest are are some of the biggest ways to move the needle and um, break through the log jams and bureaucracy and actually get things done? Right. So it's a slightly different conversation if someone's a leader and they have autonomy and authority to change the situation, and if they don't. In fact, it's a giant fjord between those two conversations. But let's start with assuming that somebody could actually do something about this. Let me tell you some of the the ways that people perhaps do it wrong to lead us toward how they could do it right. I think maybe by process of elimination, we'll get where we need to go. I just actually closed the computer five minutes before I called you and I got a deck from a major company that was saying, can you please analyze this work that we're about to do? And it's simplification work on meetings, which is a very important thing. And what they're doing is they're doing a giant, internally built, rather expensive, complicated program to fix the problem of meetings. And I was chatting with this executive and I said, this is Kind of, and they were asking us how it was different from the work that we do. And I said, oh, this is like, the difference is between buying a really nice couch and redecorating a house. And one is systemic and complete and one is a piece of it. So the, the biggest thing that we notice corporations doing wrong is they choose one piece of the most aggressive, pernicious part of their problem. Usually it's either emails or meetings. And they go in surgically only to fix that isolated problem. So they do an isolated intervention like no meeting Friday, and they make posters all over the place for no meeting Friday. And then the first month, everybody adheres to it. And the second month, people start kind of whispering in the corner saying, I know it's Friday, but I really need to meet with you about this important project. And then by the third month, the only thing that's left of this wonderful thing that they've constructed is that people make fun of no meeting Friday whenever they're in a meeting on Friday. And the whole thing just breaks apart because there was no- I have to to interrupt you just to tell you, we did did that exact same thing here. It was was two, two hours on Wednesday morning. I think it was nine to 11. Yeah. Yeah. No meetings, yeah. no talking. It was like quiet time. And I think I was- For the how long? Fir- it, w- it wasn't my idea, <laughs> someone else's idea. And I think I was the first to start making fun of it and come in and would like dance and make yeah. people laugh during quiet time. So- that's, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm guilty as charged. Okay, keep keep going. Sorry I interrupted you. No, but everybody does. I'm sorry, I just I was on a roll, but th- we call that an isolated intervention. So this is kind of like if you took a beautiful plant and you planted it on cement. There's no soil- there's no context. There's no nothing rich for the roots to grow into. It's just a little thing that you just stuck in there right in the middle of the problem. And of course it dies. Mm-hmm. The, the contrast to that would be to first talk about mindset, culture, yep. philosophy, conformity, our relationship with time. Most executives don't have the patience to think through the psychology that leads their teams to this problem. They just want a quick fix. Either give me some new rules for Outlook or give me no meeting Friday and get me out the door because I can get my brain around that. But but behavior change is really the solution here and that takes time. So I, I think that the thing I wanted to highlight what you're saying here, Juliet, is, is crazy important is a lot of times I think in our organizations, we kind of want other people to think for us. So here's the rule to follow. And I, I wanted to highlight what you're saying is because I, I think that this we're not trying to get people to do what they're told. We're trying to get them to think and to understand the culture. So we all, every person in our organization has to think efficiency. We all have to think productivity. We, we have to think, how do our requests impact others? 
How do our, if we make a mistake and then we create a rule, how does that rule or policy slow things down? And so I'd love it if you could talk just a little bit more about the mindset. If if you're coming in to coach me or someone else and we're gonna try to help shift the mindset in our organization, you're not just doing what you're told, you're not just a part, kind of going along with what has been happening, but you're gonna help create a new culture of, of efficiency. What, what, what would you say to that leader to help lead toward a different way of thinking? I would say, first of all, congratulations for being a leader who's, uh, you know, 8% of companies are doing something about the problem. About 80% of companies have this problem. So the first thing I'd say is thank God for you and congratulations. But there, there are a lot of different components that are necessary for this work to work. And I think sometimes that leader that you're describing may not understand what they need to be. So these leaders that you're describing, and I know a lot of them, the first thing they do is they just try to begin talking about it. They In their town halls, in their one-on-ones, if they have a plane ride next to one of their direct reports, they start talking about, we should be more efficient. We should do less stuff. We should think about cutting. And they, they think that this dialogue approach is going to teach their people enough to fortify them in the path towards simplification. But dialogue is really not enough. There has to be a framework that leads people through a very specific path. What are the behavioral changes I need to make? What are the ways that I need to think differently? How can I learn those next to my neighbor so that Ted and Fred and Mary and Sue all are operating on the same framework and can amplify each other's success? It's actually not an incredibly simple thing to attack. So the the first mindset that we teach that we believe that everybody has to start with is what we call a reductive mindset. And we mean reductive in the mathematical sense. When you develop a reductive mindset, you decide that you will make a habit of cutting and surrendering and renouncing and simplifying and deleting and skipping and omitting everywhere you go. So you become a person who has a lens in front of them. And everywhere you look, your to-do list, your meeting calendar, your inbox, your goals, your projects, you're asking yourself questions on what can you let go of, what deserves your attention, where can perfectionism be curbed, where are you indulging in information too much and it's becoming overload, and you're constantly questioning. And that one lens, that reductive mindset, if it were shared among an entire team and then given permission by a leader who was modeling it above them can begin to make some significant changes. So that's that's a, a principle that we've kind of been working on here, that the, the mindset is brilliant. And I, I love the list. I wish I could repeat it when you said, I'll send cut, it to you. skip, <laughs> edit. What, it, it, that, <laughs> can you say it again or does that just come out naturally? Uh, it's I say it a lot of different ways, but a reductive mindset means that I am willing to renounce, let go, eliminate, surrender, delegate, automate, skip, delete, and just plain kill projects and to-dos in my work life. And life is getting so full and there's always going to be this stream coming in, coming in, coming in that we just have to simply have to have a parallel muscle on the other side that is letting go, letting go, letting go, letting go. And it's not how corporations think. The corporation mindset is additive. We add initiative and tasks. We add developmental programs. We add, we add, we add. It's just a completely different way of thinking. You said earlier, complexity is seductive, which I thought was a strong way of saying it. That it so if we're going to make this change, one of the things that you teach, Juliet, is that leaders need to go first. Can, can you tell us, you know, why is this so important for the leader to adopt a reductive mindset and to model it for their teams? It's not only important that they adopt it, it's really important that it's authentic because they'll smell it if you're talking about it out of one side of your mouth and then sending, you know, 4 a.m. emails out of the other side of your mouth. So they, they do understand that there's a risk to them by doing this unless they have leadership modeling. Uh, this kind of change is very permission-based. And it's not that way with every kind of teaching. If I came in and I said I wanted to teach all of your team's sales skills or negotiation skills or outlook procedures or anything that was more safe, 
you wouldn't need a leader to do it over you because you'd know it's great for me to learn negotiation. But if you're going to start saying no to things, you're going to start writing really brief emails that really get to the point. You're going to start opting out of unnecessary meetings. You're going to start questioning why are we doing 14 projects at the same time. That's terrifying for people who, you know, aren't in a, a super senior executive position. So they have to be looking uphill, seeing a leader who is giving them that tacit wink to say, no, really, really, I want you to be doing this. It's okay and it's safe. And that permission-based framework is is absolutely non-negotiable in this kind of work. We really never see it work in the grassroots up. And in fact, I was just reading an HBR article about simplification and they cited these six companies that were doing all this exciting simplification work, but five out of the six were driven directly from the CEO and one was the CFO. So they didn't come in with any stories of, you know, Ted started a grassroots movement for simplification. It was all top down. I think there, there's almost no way it would succeed unless it is from the top down. And so I really want our leaders to hear this, that, that you set the tone and I like what Juliet said, it's, it's got to be authentic. So some of the things I hope you cover in the book, and I want to ask you to talk about these principles rapid fire, yeah. and I've got four, four or five things down. So can you tell us what is 2D versus 3D communication? 2D versus 3D is a way of considering which medium you use for which type of communication. So there's format and then there's content. So a 2D format or a 2D medium is something that is two-dimensional, email, texting, I am chat. A 3D format is something that is three-dimensional, a meeting, the phone, face-to-face -face time when we can hear people and maybe see them. What happens ineffectively is when you cross the wrong content with the wrong medium, because there's also two different kinds of content. 2D content is simple yes, no, fact-driven information. This is, can I have the deck? Will you meet me at four? What's the address? This is very, very simple. 3D has nuance and complexity and emotion, and sometimes it can have conflict. And so where you get in trouble is if you try to shove 3D content into a 2D medium, i.e. a sputtering email thread that has 53 chapters to it, you're going nowhere and you're wasting time. Conversely, you take 2D content, like a simple calendar or a report out, and you put it in a 3D medium, like a meeting, now you're wasting everybody's time as well. So it, it, what you want to do is stick with the right content that matches the format 2D in 2D and 3D in 3D. Where this becomes very powerful is where people start using this as colloquial language in a team. They'll start on an email thread that's getting too long and they'll say, I think this needs to be 3D and they'll cut it and they'll jump right off. And so that's, that's when you really start getting the juice out of the term. Super helpful. I love your practical tools. Let me ask you about three more. What is the yellow list? Help us. My favorite. So the yellow list is a simple document that will transform the amount of email that you have in your inbox. Here's what you do. You make a document either for every single person that you work with frequently or a master yellow list that's separated by people's names. When you have an impulse to send an email, you pause and you say, should this communication actually even be in an email? Should it be a phone call? Should it be a text if it's really time sensitive? Or if it's not, should it just be put into the repository of the yellow list? And then you add things and add things and add things. And then when they accumulate, you ping that person and say, hey, can we have a short yellow list debrief? And you go through the list verbally. You save yourself all the beginning of those email threads that have all those email babies and generate more and more and more activity in your inbox. And you can hold anything there that's not time sensitive. The other thing that the yellow list does is it makes you pause before you send the email. And sometimes you'll realize that the communication you're thinking of asking or sending is never even needs to be communicated in any medium at all. It was just an impulse that you forgot to check. Man, that, so I'm feeling that one right now, and especially your phrase, email babies, just made me laugh. But <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking right now that there's three people that I work with regularly, and I send impulse emails all the time. Sure you do. And we interact with regularly enough that if I took on a yellow list, I could, I would probably accumulate four or five things, you know, on average a day that aren't urgent that could go into a list. And then at one point of communication, we cover all of them rather than what might turn into 
19 different emails going back and forth. It's breaking everybody's momentum. So right. that's that's gold right there. And I hope that people listening can kind of think about that and maybe consider internalizing it. Two more, this is really, really helpful, Juliet. When you talk about SBH meetings, what is what does that mean? SBH is a mantra that you say only inside your own head, and it stands for shouldn't be here. The instruction is next time you're sitting in a meeting and you notice that you're neither participating or contributing or benefiting, you say inside your head SBH. And the reason that you're saying this to yourself is to increase the healthy discomfort that will eventually lead you to do something about the fact that you're sitting in the wrong seat at the wrong time. Very, very scary for people to begin a conversation about, I don't think I should have been in this meeting, or maybe can I opt out next time? So that SBH instruction, you just keep saying, SBH shouldn't be here, shouldn't be here, shouldn't be here, shouldn't be here. And there's just a point where there's just so much you can handle hearing yourself say it and knowing the absolute clear truth of it. And it will probably prompt you to start having conversations that shift your meeting attendance. So if I'm a leader of an organization and I don't care about anything you're talking about, an employee comes and says, I shouldn't be here. I might be offended. I might think the employee doesn't care. But if I'm a leader that is trying to lead first and really trying to create a culture that values people's time and does everything possible to eliminate whatever wastes productivity and increase our value and a team member comes and says, I shouldn't be in this meeting, I'm actually going to probably embrace that and say, I'm, I'm glad you brought it to my attention. SBH, I like the way you said, say it to yourself. <laughs> it's not a, it's not an out loud instruction. Yeah, you don't just don't think out no, loud. No, 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 that leader, it depends on how evolved they are in their own understanding of what, if that person that you trust, presumably you, you've, they're still on your team, so presumably that you trust them. If they're coming and saying that my presence in this meeting is taking time away from something that's tactically more relevant to the business, then we would hope that you trust them. And of course, work is sometimes tedious, but there's a different kind of awareness that comes when you're sitting in a meeting where you're redundant or it's full of 2D or it's a sputtering kind of a conversation that's just going in circles. There's a lot of different reasons why people feel disengaged in meetings. When they reach for their digital technology, that's when they mute that instructive boredom. And so abstaining from the multitasking will also force you into a state of SBH because you take away the candy that distracts you from how bored you are, then you'll really feel it. So Juliet, I could do this all day long. I'm taking notes like crazy. I want to ask you about one more, and then I want to give you a chance to talk about what you can offer our listeners and talk really specifically about how they can benefit from what you do. One of the things you talk about is the six-week delusion. Can you tell us what that is? Yes, this is one of my favorite mental tricks that that gets played on us. And it happened to me just the other day, I was asked to do a podcast, as I'm sure you are asked to do many. And not all of them are my dear friend, Craig, who I know and respect so much. You just don't know who these people are. And so you trying to figure out if you should say yes or no. And I said, I think I said, well, you know what, right now I'm pretty busy, but I think in December, December looks pretty good or, or late November looks pretty good. And at whatever time period I said, it was about six to eight weeks in the future. And this is what we call the six-week delusion is when I get to November or December, that time period in my life will be absolutely guaranteed to be just as busy as the present. But at the moment, my calendar is clear. And so I have this tricky hallucination that leads me to believe that pushing that acceptance a little further in the future will have it occur at a time when I'm less busy. But that's never the case because when you arrive in the future, it feels exactly like the present. And we do this six to eight weeks at a time, pushing and pushing the things that we should maybe have the bravery to simply say no to in the present, deluded by this visceral sense of, oh, I'll have time for this later. And then it never feels that way when the time comes around. So we call that the six-week delusion. That's something I think we all deal. I I, I would have like even a 12-month delusion <laughs> or someone asks for something a year from now, like, oh, it's wide open. Yep. Let's do that. Right. And then it comes around and what was I what was I thinking? So 
that's a good phrase for people to keep in front of their minds. Before you jump into the giveaway, can I address one thing that you were just talking about before you pivoted and we didn't get to? Please, please do. It's just, you asked why people should change this in corporations. And we almost started talking about why they should change it now instead of in six months or 12 months or two years. And and that's just such an incredibly important part of the conversation because this topic is so easily kicked down the road. We'll fix it later. We'll fix it later. We'll fix it later. If a million for 50 annually is not motivation enough, I will say that one of the things about simplifying is that it then accelerates every other thing that you want. So let's say that you're a leader who has seven things. They're trying to order which of the organizational changes that they're going to make. I would argue that liberating time first then pours fuel on all the other six. And I think that that's a really, really important orientation is saying, oh yeah, we're going to simplify things in 2023 better than not simplifying them at all. But there's a very, very specific reason why the bulldozer of simplification could, should come first, clear the ground, and then upon that you build. And it, it we almost started talking about that and I just wanted to slip it in there. That's, that's so important. And, and you know, both, both personally and organizationally, this is really the, the biggest thing that I'm working on and at the top of my mind. And I got here, Juliet, more because... It, I really got to the place of being overwhelmed. And I think some people who are might hear what we're saying and, and find the motivation to go ahead and attack it. But but I would just encourage you, the best time to start it is before you're overwhelmed. <laughs> right. And, and right. take this incredibly seriously because this is, so much is at stake and, and we're so distracted and we're organizationally, we make things so complicated that it really does slow down our productivity. And it, and as much as it robs us from what we could do opportunity wise, it's incredibly frustrating to our team members when they know they're underperforming their potential and in SBH meetings mm-hmm. saying in their mind, I shouldn't, shouldn't be here. And that helps that they're, they feel undervalued rather than valued. I'd, I'd love, I want to, again, your book's going to come out in 2021 called White Space. I'd love to talk a little bit about what you offer. You offer White Space training courses and they can find out about these at whitespaceatwork.com. Yes. You also want to offer some free resources that'll help us overcome some of the thieves of productivity. Can you tell us what what the resource is? And then we'll try to figure out how to get these into the, the hands of people that want to improve. Yeah, you and I were brainstorming some fun giveaways. We thought this one would be probably the most germane to your audience. So the thieves of productivity is a model within the world of white space. Remember I said you have to have frameworks that people can kind of hang on to, to understand how to move in this path together. The thieves of productivity are the four main drivers that fuel professional overload, and they differ in their intensity person to person. So we developed a developmental assessment similar to a DISC model where you can determine which of the four thieves of productivity may be most dominant and risky for you and what to do about it and how the other thieves fall underneath that dominant thief. So we'd love to let any listener have the developmental assessment as a gift from today's podcast. And to get that, all you have to do is write to info at whitespaceatwork.com and put in the subject line assessment. The most powerful way to receive your gift is to put your entire team through the assessment together and then debrief so that you can understand which thieves are in the room and how many of one there are and how they parse out among your team members. Okay. So just to be clear, they'll they'll email you and this is a valuable email that you do want to send. And is this a need response by when? I'm just <laughs> no, curious. No codes. We just learned them. You don't have to use them yet. <laughs> okay. So it, info at whitespace at work.com. Right. And then they'll put assessment in the memo line and then you'll, uh, you'll we'll send you everything else you need to do. Yeah. And just make sure that you, you get your whole team to write in because you want this to be communal, like all mindset shifts should be. Nobody should be left out. Yeah. That's so we, we want a common vocabulary. We want a common mindset. And so I really do encourage you to do it, do this with your teams. And I just want to say on a personal note, Juliet, thank you for what you do. Thank you for who you are. This mindset and philosophy, it emanates out of your, your whole family. And I kind of get nerdy and excited about books every now and then, but your your book, White Space, is on the 
top of the list of oh, um, Craig, the you. one that, that I can't wait to read. In fact, I'm going to beg you to let me endorse it just so I can get an early copy and read it ahead of time. So thank you for what you're doing. And I just want to encourage all of our listeners. This is a leader that can really help you grow, help your organization become uh, even more efficient. Whitespaceatwork.com is the place. And then as promised, we'll have Julia back on in the future. We wish you the best. Thank you for taking time to uh, to be with us today, Julia. Thanks so much. And thank you all for being a part of our, our leadership community. Remember on the first Thursday of every month, we'll come out with new content that hopefully will help your organization become stronger. And I just want to encourage you, you don't have to know it all. You don't have to be perfect in every way. Just show up, be you, be yourself. Because remember, people would rather follow a leader who's always real than one who's always right. Thank you for joining us at the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. If you want to go even deeper into this episode and get the leadership guide or show notes, you can go to life.church slash leadership podcast. You can also sign up to have that information delivered straight to your inbox every month. In the meantime, you can subscribe to this podcast, rate and review it on iTunes, and share with your friends on social media. Once again, thank you for joining us at the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast.